All right. Podcast, Snafu Podcast, number four with Benjamin Mac Jackson, the founder of World War II Veterans History Project. Benjamin, welcome. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Yeah, great. How have you been doing in the, in the last couple of weeks, months? Have you been going, you, like, you haven't been able to go around and interview veterans? Yeah, it's been a difficult past couple of months during this pandemic, uh, not being able to interview veterans and, and protecting them uh, from this, this deadly virus. And uh, we've been finding other ways to uh, accomplish the mission of the project uh, in, in, instead of doing these these one-on-one -on -one interviews at this moment. Uh, it's very unfortunate that we can't talk to the World War II veterans at the moment, and uh, I'm, I'm sad to see so many of them passing during this, this uh, difficult time. Uh, right. But hopefully things uh, start to uh, open back up soon and uh, we can get back to doing interviews. Right. There's been some crazy st stories. Well, not crazy, but there's been some amazing stories, too, about veterans surviving Corona, beating Corona. And that's exactly you know, yeah. Like yeah. people yeah. that are 102 Remarkable. years old. And it's like, wow. Insane. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you are 17 years old. Am I, I right? actually just turned 18. No. Earlier this oh. <laughs> okay, sorry, I forgot. You're 18 years old. <laughs> you have interviewed over a hundred hundreds of veterans. You have you have a traveling World War II museum. You are working on a documentary, and you recently started a project where you bought a Higgins boat, and you're going to restore that. And this is all under the name World War II Veterans uh, History Project. And it's like seeing that for like me as a 25 year old looking at you. You started this when you were 13. It's like it's like boom, you're living the dream. You're talking to so many people. Why did you start World War II, the World War II Veterans History Project? Well, when I was 13 years old, uh, I did my first interview, but it, it all goes back to when I was in fifth grade, when I was uh, rather young and uh, I was reading about World War II in my history textbook. And there was only two pages about the war in my textbook, two pages from Pearl Harbor to the surrender of Japan on one spread. Uh, and I, I knew there had to be more, and uh, my my always been interested in history, and so I went to the library and I got books and documentaries, and I learned and learned from there, and that was really my opening experience into World War II. And I'd watch these documentaries and see the veterans talking, and it kind of hit me one day uh, that I could ask ask the questions that I had uh, and talk to these men and women firsthand, and that's when I began my first interview at 13. Uh, the veteran was 92. Uh, so quite a large age gap wow. there, uh, but we had a fantastic interview uh, and it's prompted me to do now over a hundred over the past five years. Wow. What, what was the veteran's name? You know, uh, his name is Charles Consler uh, and he was a P-51 fighter pilot during the wow. war. So this was a, a pretty incredible introduction to starting interviews. Uh, he told me about shooting down a German plane uh, over Sweden during the, uh, the late days of World War II. Uh, and that just prompted me to continue doing more interviews. And he gave me the contacts for his friends who were World War II veterans and so on and so forth. It just spiraled uh, into something that I would have never uh, imagined uh, looking back on it as a 13-year-old. As I would have never thought um, I'd be where I am today. But I, I'm grateful for, for everything that's happened. Right. So was that like, you? did you already have, uh, like, was, was VHP already found? Like, did, was it, did you found the, the, the nonprofit already when you were, like, when you started to interview, uh, the, doing your first interview? No, at, at first it was really just interest and I just wanted to talk to a veteran. So I just sat down and did one interview and then kept doing a couple more. And then I realized this, was, this could be a, make a big impact and that if I continued doing these interviews and did it in a more professional format, uh, it can be used for generations to come to teach the stories of World War II. And, and that's when I started the nonprofit a couple of years later. I believe it was in 2016 uh, when I officially formed the uh, nonprofit 501c3 World War II Veterans History Project. Uh, and that's when everything started to take off, really. Interesting. That is uh, like at my high school, when I went elementary school, like what, what, what age are you when you're in fifth grade? Because that's so it's different here. In, I don't, I don't in, remember. But it, it, it was pretty young. It was pretty young. Because I remember me in elementary school, at, I believe we started getting into World War II when around the age, yeah, when I was 12, I guess. Mm -hmm. And that was like the only the only test, history test there where I got a 10 out of 10. Like I right, right. <laughs> um, We had like, we had like some 
stuff about the war, but not like not the maybe D Day right. was mentioned, uh, but. I'm, I'm, I mean, I can imagine if you're reading two lines on that and you know... I guess, you did you already know at the time it was a significant part of, of world history or American history? Definitely. I mean, I've always been interested in history, like I said, and, and uh, I, I raised as a very patriotic and uh, appreciative peer person for our, of our veterans. Uh, and I've always been involved with um, that. And so when I discovered that World War II part it, it just really stuck with me and so uh, but history has always been a part of my life but when I okay. found World War II it, it really changed it uh, right. that was that was it for me so to say that really took my my passion for history to the next level so to say right that's great do, do you have any relatives that that served in World War II yeah both my great-grandfathers were uh in the Navy during World War II uh, right. they passed away long before I was even born so I never had the opportunity to speak with them so that was right. not even a a motivation for the project I, I learned about that after it already had been started wow. uh, and uh, it's it's been interesting to uncover their stories and uh, see what they would have been like uh, through artifacts through uh, first-hand accounts from family members and things like that uh, but yeah. that it was not a family connection as most some people believe, think that at first uh, but that was a discovery right. along the way really yeah well I guess it is not like it's not unusual. Like I, I am. I know that my grandparents World War Two. I never really looked at them until I started, you know, until I was far into researching the exactly, battlefields. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, did you research their stories? Did you know like what ships they served on or what they did exactly? Yeah, um, one was on the USS Nutmeg, which was a a stateside based uh, minesweeper, and they patrolled uh, harbors up in uh, the, the North Atlantic area and laid submarine nets and things like that. Wow. Um, and the other one was on a destroyer in the Mediterranean theater of operations, uh, the USS Speed, it was called. Uh, and it had some pretty significant campaigns there, but that's been a, a little bit more difficult to research over the past uh, couple of years. But yeah, it, it, both, on, both in the Navy, and I've been able to research what I can about their stories. Oh, did you get their service records? I actually haven't yet. <laughs> oh, no. You should yeah, get them. You know, there is a pictures in the Navy, in the Navy record. Yeah, 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 there's yeah. pictures. That would be pretty cool to see. Yeah, you should go there yourselves, yeah. man. If you have to yeah, see. when things start to open back up, <laughs> uh, I, my, that's my goal. I've been, I was trying to plan a trip for the summer to go up there and to the archives, but obviously uh, the world had other plans. So. Right, I see, I see. Wow. So, so you, one of your motivations was to like change the you could say curriculum in, in, in elementary school or school in general, you want to teach the next, the, the other generations, the, the, the younger generations about World War II. Exactly. How, how do you do that with uh, VHP, with Veterans History well, Project? Yeah, initially it was just doing interviews and posting them on my website. And then I discovered the impact that it could have on teaching my generation and future generations. Right. And so I started doing school speaking engagements and uh, I've spoken to uh, students of all ages. So from elementary school, as young as kindergarten and first grade, uh, all the way into high school uh, and beyond, uh, right. and, and even in college, college students that I've really spoken. So I've spoken to students younger than me, older than me. Um, and obviously the, um, the curriculum that I have for that is completely different for the different grades. Uh, right. But I've had an incredible experience with with these students, thousands of them that I've spoken to all across the country. Uh, and they've all been very uh, understanding and, um, and, and they've had a great, great uh, opportunity to learn history through these presentations. And uh, right. when I first started it, I didn't really know what to expect, expect. Right. Uh, but it's been wonderful. And I've, I've, I'm proud to say that the stories that I've collected are now touching the lives of thousands of people um, from the future generation. Right. Do you have do you have help with people who help you on um, creating these these different uh, like I as you said you have a different uh, presentation and different uh, schedule for every age group that you probably uh, meet. Do you have like do you have a you have, you got you must have a big team around you doing that. Actually, not um, as far as the presentations are concerned. I really, really like to control those uh, myself and, and and make those uh, myself. And I, I'm. I, I pride myself on being uh, essentially a one-man team at the moment and uh, it, because of lack of funding or, or other reasons. But I, right. uh, yeah, the presentations in schools, uh, I pr prepare the curriculum. I speak to the students. Um, I coordinate all the, the travel and all that stuff. So it's, it's, 
it's it's a lot of work to to do all of that in it, but it really pays off it's it's the most rewarding experience that to know that, that what amazing. i've been doing is, is making a difference and that's what it's all about uh is inspiring people and uh, making them aware of the stories that uh are are often forgotten all right that's amazing are you like aren't you not like a I mean, I would be a little bit scared to stand in front of like, it, like if you're talking to college students, how do you like, what is a, um, how do you say that? What, what does a speech or a presentation look like? How do you? Yeah, well, well, the presentations that I do are, are very um, specially crafted that I, I create and to make them um, both educational and also um, enter to en entertainment so that they can be uh, used and, and the, the students can get into them, so to say. Uh, and, and and actually know what's what, what they're talking what I'm talking about and uh, in a, in a fun uh, way. So when I'm talking to uh, students in, in elementary school or middle school, obviously that curriculum is a lot different than high school and college. Right. Um, but a presentation that I do it consists of um, I, I I've always been a natural speaker. Uh, I I love getting up in front of people and talking. That's just one of one of the things that I like to do. <laughs> That's so good. Uh, even from a young age, before all of this, I've always liked to talk to people. Uh, both both one on one or um, <laughs> large groups of people, so that's that hasn't been a problem. But as far as talking to uh, people, the curriculum that I use, I, I do historic facts, I do clips from interviews, I, I show artifacts from the war, and it all encompasses in, into this um, really well rounded presentation that can get students inspired. So I show clips from from documentaries that I've created, uh, and it, it's it's all really a one experience. Right. Uh, the program. And what is what is your what is your general message with your presentation? Like, do you have like a what are you trying yeah, to well, bring over? D definitely, the the main message that I I think that I try to instill upon the students that I'm speaking to is to remember history uh, and to remember the veterans that fought for our freedom during the war. And I think it's important that history isn't forgotten, especially um, in for future generations. They, they need to understand and appreciate the sacrifices of the greatest generation and other generations in order to have a successful future. And right. I think that uh, that's one of the things that I, I really um, firmly believe is important. Great. That's awesome. Yeah, I think, I think especially if, you know, with, with American history being so big, and, yes. and then having just two, like in your in your elementary school having just two lines dedicated to World War Two, it's always it's good that there's people out there who shows who show like that that you know freedom is not free. Exactly. Um, coming from a background where my grandparents and I, everyone like they they lived under the German occupation, the Nazi occupation. Right. Um, like if you see, if like America, American has fought wars, and I want to. Uh, that's what that's what I that's what I think is so much different about our countries. Like you guys fought the wars, you liberated us, but we lived, we endured the occupation, occupation. part. We lived, we lived exactly. through that. Like my grandparents yeah. were five years old. I'm coming from Rotterdam, my my hometown. Well, I'm I'm officially, my, my oh my grandparents come from Rotterdam. I live in a town next to Rotterdam. But right. Rotterdam was bombed in 1940s by the Germans, and the right. center was completely wiped out. And uh, you know, my grandparents were five years old, five years old at the time, and some were even old, a little bit older, but not. I don't think they were above ten. And then they lived through the war, and it's like w they told me stuff when I was like, small things about the hunger. And like, Joe, you you're not hungry. You just have you're just craving food, mm -hmm. you know, and stuff like that. Um, so uh, yeah, it's it's great that I know. I mean, it's just as great that you're telling a generation how you know what it was like seven years ago, and that there are people fighting for 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 something called freedom. And exactly. I guess the most important part is that most of those guys they never wanted to, they never signed up to fight. Some of them they had to do it. They were so normal. They were normal people like you and me. Um, um, and that's that's I I, I mean what, like looking at you you're 17 years old you're almost at the age where like men uh, were being drafted they were exactly. uh, sent yeah. to the front lines how do how do you I mean are are you realizing that more and more now now you, I mean it's 18 years old are you realizing that more and more now um, when when you're doing all of this stuff yeah and it's 
that it brings up a really great point. Uh, I the veterans that I've interviewed that are now all in their 90s or hundreds. I mean, the youngest veteran I interviewed was 92, the oldest 104. Right. So uh, now they're in the, the, this this incredible uh, age of longevity. Uh, but some of them during World War II were were 16, 17, 18 years old. I mean, I interviewed one veteran and he enlisted at the age of 16 in the Marine Corps uh, off of a forged birth certificate. Uh, oh, yeah. And I was I was 15 at the time when I did that interview. So I, I could really connect oh, to that. And it really made me uh, understand um, the, the, the will and determination of the greatest generation to make a difference in, in not only our, our American society, but the society and the livelihood of the entire world. Uh, to fight for freedom and democracy and to uh, to to destroy tyranny from the face of the earth. Right. Uh, and these, these were were the values that were being fought to preserve during the war what was uh, this 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 uh, freedom. And, and this particular veteran, Joe Bloom, when he was describing that to me, he, 16 years old, he decided to enter the Marines, fought in Okinawa uh, in 1945. Right. And um, pretty, pretty incredible story, uh, not only his combat experience, but the way he got there. Yeah, I see. I actually saw this interview of you uh, t t today because right. I thought it was a crazy story. And I've been on Okinawa yeah. myself, but I when I when I wanted to ask when I came up with this question is because I saw this video and I was like, wow, right, this, right. <laughs> this guy must have been around your age when you interviewed him. Yeah. And unfortunately, he just passed away uh, earlier this year. Oh, really? Uh, or or later last year, I, I forget, but uh, it, it, he recently passed away, unfortunately, um, but he lived a, a long and wonderful life, and uh, I'm just honored to have the opportunity to preserve his story for generations. Right. To come. I think that is what what is most important here with your stuff is that when you, re like, back in the days when you did an interview, you wrote things down. You know, and doing an oral history, creating like filming the guy and, and putting it somewhere where it can be stored for ages. It's, it's so has so much value to history. It's, exactly. Yeah, it's it's really important. Right. So, um, where do you get all your items? You have a traveling museum. Where, where do you get all of your items? Do you buy them? Do you collect yourself? Well, 90% uh, or, or over 90% of the items that we have in the World War II Veterans History Project uh, archive have been donated by veterans or the family members of veterans. And so uh, these are all personal stories that I'm telling uh, of these heroes' lives. Uh, medals of valor, uniforms, helmets, photographs, flags, uh, you name it, the, the, the collection has it. Uh, and I've created a traveling museum that uh, I bring to different schools and events and places all across the country uh, as an addition to my programs. And it's, it's really a way for students to learn history in an interactive way. Uh, if you think about it, there's a lot of other subjects that have interactive components in math. Even from a young age, you're, you, you learn math in an interactive way, whether it's with uh, blocks or, or something like that, just something simple. Uh, but in math, science, things like that. But if you think about history, there's, there's very little interactive curriculum for history that's directly based in schools. And so when I bring these artifacts into the schools for students to see, um, it really changes and elevates the uh, education uh, of, of the war. And so when, I'm, when I bring artifacts into the, the, <laughs> the schools, uh, the students tell me sometimes, oh, I've never seen a real helmet before. I've never seen a real uniform before. I've never been to a museum. Uh, and it's things like that that make it uh, completely worth it, that now we can see uh, artifacts from the war and, and experience the history firsthand. And, and I, I have several programs that are, are developed strictly for students to handle the artifacts, things that aren't as historically significant, uh, no provenance behind them, but they're original wartime artifacts that can be handled and felt um, just to get another personal uh, approach to learning history. Wow. That's amazing. I have yeah, I have a picture of here with you standing behind your s small displays of photographs. I see a uniform in the back. That's uh, it's it's. I think it's amazing, especially because as a kid you are like, oh my god, that's a real helmet. Oh my god, that's a exactly. Weapon. Yeah, <laughs> it's and much you'd be more. Surprised. Some of the reactions from the younger younger kids are almost exactly the same as the reaction from college students. Uh, some of them have never seen a real uniform before or a real really? helmet like that. Uh, and again, that's what, what, what it's all about is to, to bring the history to everyone. Exactly. Uh, and and it, it, when I first did these presentations, I thought, 
I thought it was going to be a very um, large gap <clears throat> between the younger and the older students. But in reality, it's exactly the same. They all have uh, an interest in it really deep down, I think. Um, but it needs to be taught the right way uh, for that interest in that um, that inspiration to come out. I think you're exactly right on that point. And uh, there's just that there, it's this is just a per the perfect way to do it, I guess. Um, I've, I've had great success with it and um, I, I hope in the future to continue it. Right. And but it's not like also like you, you are interesting people with these items, but I think they, they, the kids and even the, 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 the college students, they are going to ask themselves, oh, what did my grandparents do during the war? Exactly. I hear that all the time. <laughs> yeah. I, oh, they, yeah. Do you hear like stories of people that, OK, my yeah, grandparent was in this unit and he fought there and there? Yeah, sometimes they tell me it's something right there. They say, "Oh, I didn't. I, I I've heard my grandfather was in World War II, but I'm not. I'm not so certain. I'm going to go home today and look it up and talk to my dad about it, whatever. Wow, uh, things like that. Or they know the history already and they share it with me. And sometimes they follow up with me later after they've already they've looked something up. Um, and that's really cool to see as well, knowing that my presentation and and the artifacts that I've shown have inspired them to learn about their own family history, wow. which is so important to preserve. Wow, that's. That's that's yeah that sounds great man that's that's when you're really making an impact definitely so i think i guess all of this you've been doing all these stories you've been collecting all these stories that that all sort of um came together when you went to normandy last year uh yeah. with uh with our with our team footsteps researchers yeah. it was uh, awesome <laughs> you you tried to make a you're you're making a documentary what is the, what is the goal of that documentary It's what is it? Yeah, well, the, the documentary I'm creating is uh, Normandy Revisited, uh, and it's a feature length documentary film uh, encompassing the story of D Day through veteran interviews, through historic artifacts, and also battlefield exploration. Uh, and like you said, uh, we went to Normandy last summer. It was a life changing experience for me to experience right. all of that and, of course, travel with a World War II veteran who was there. That was uh, the most amazing experience right. that anyone could have ever wished for. And uh, and I was I had the honor, the true honor, to capture all of that on on video and um, hours and hours of video just from Normandy and combined with 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 hours of, of veteran interviews that I've done here in the states, right. along with artifacts from the war, all is going to encompass into Normandy re revisited, um, and it's currently in the final stages of production, and uh, I'm just really excited to be able to uh, share all these stories and uh, right. uh, in in one. Uh, large yeah. film. I think people are gonna love seeing that Chad Cochin story. Oh yes. Plus, yeah. you have tons of other stuff like that, and it's uh, I'm I'm showing the trailer right now without the sound on, but it's uh you know it's I think it's gonna be a great 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 thing because a lot of people know about Normandy, a lot of people have seen Normandy, but actually like it's difficult when you're talking about. When veterans talk about a story and you don't see a location or you don't know a thing and you know what this yeah, is and this, this is going to connect all of that uh, exactly that are going to be talking about something and then that location is going to be right there um point to hawk uh omaha beach utah beach uh all those those lo locations that we visited uh in normandy will be uh included and uh it's going to be a, a pretty incredible uh, collection of, of stories under one name right That's great, man. I'm so looking so much forward to it. I think everyone does. <laughs> What you're? It's in, the DVDs are for pre-order now. When are? Yeah, the DVDs are, are now available for pre-order. Um, we expect everything to be uh, released and, and shipped out late July, early August, and um, that'll be a, a awesome, pretty incredible thing. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it, man. Yeah. <laughs> so the if you. Like if the people who are watching now, if they think, okay, this guy has been doing great stuff, it and it cannot, you might think it cannot be get it cannot get any better. Sorry for my, my language here, but uh, um, you, how many months ago did you buy a Higgins boat? Well, a little correction there. It was actually donated. Okay. Um, it was donated, but it was in April. Uh, I'll I'll tell the story. It's it's very interesting. So, um, <laughs> a call to, a call to action was placed essentially on Facebook. Um, for someone to rescue this uh, original World War II LCVP Higgins boat. And if right. you don't know what a Higgins boat is for everyone listening, it's a, an original World War II landing craft that transported the troops ashore, has a, a big steel door on the front that drops down and all the soldiers can come off 
Uh, it's one of the most iconic images from World War II. Uh, and so when I first had this opportunity to acquire it, I was like, let's go, let's do it, because <laughs> this is incredibly historic. It's, it's a remarkable piece of history. And just seeing it uh, sitting there in, in the field from the one photo that I had from the start was enough to get me to go forward. Uh, as my research went on, uh, it got a little bit more difficult to um, get this thing here and uh, actually acquire it. It weighs uh, a, a lot, yeah, almost 18,000 pounds. Wow. Uh, it's, th it's 36 feet long uh, by 11 feet wide. Uh, it's a massive, massive craft and uh, it's an oversized load on a, a truck. So that's the very, makes it very difficult to transport. Right. And so uh, we had the incredible support of so many people to make this possible. And in April, we did successfully move the Higgins boat from Texas, where it was located mm -hmm. now to Florida, where it's it's being stored and uh, waiting restoration to uh, complete a complete restoration to seaworthy condition right. uh, in the year to come. Yeah, on the photo, one photo you have, it's like it's sending it's sending outside. It endured. Did it endure? endure all weathers there that was it staying out, outside for most of the time before you so got... that one photo that you see there is actually the first photo with it outside uh, on like black top is uh, uh that's a, a current semi-current photo from april it's covered up now and everything of course but when we first found it uh it was laying essentially on the ground there was nothing holding it up it was sitting on rotten wow. wooden pallets and so it was essentially dug into the ground in certain places and that had to be lifted up placed onto a trailer, which was probably the most difficult step because you couldn't get under it very well. So we had to find places inside the boat to lift it from and watch as it was lifted up and, and hope and hope that it didn't fall <laughs> apart. <laughs> I can because imagine it, that. The, the condition is not ideal, of course. Uh, it's, a lot of the wood is rotten, uh, but there's a lot <laughs> still intact. The door is completely intact. All the prop and the rudder are still there. Uh, uh, there's a couple internal uh, parts as well that are still intact. Um, some of the uh, chains and stuff that lower down the ramp. Wow. It was last uh, being used in the early 1990s, the last time it was actually running in the water. So not that long ago. Uh, and um, it's going to be quite a project to restore it to seaworthy condition again, but I'm excited for it. And I know that we've had, we have a lot of people that are anxious to get working on it. And um, it'll be a pretty fun project for the right. years to come. Yeah, I, re I, I remember you sending me a link that you uh, were going to trying to get your hands on this boat and that you also yeah, sent yeah. A, a Google Maps link and you saw the yeah, boat yeah, in, in the backyard. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. And we, I, I guess everyone on the team was like, oh, my God, are, yeah. is he really getting a boat? And we were like, yeah, <laughs> how many? Well, that, was my, that was my reaction, too. I mean, it, right. I was I, I was when I first saw it people were talking to me oh we can just put it on a trailer we can move it somewhere or whatever but once we started to see and, and actually understand the the true size of this this move just this one move to pick it up and move it a, a couple states um it got pretty difficult and uh, i had to work pretty hard uh to make that happen and, and of course been supported by so many people both here in florida and over in texas uh, and the coronavirus obviously did not help. I was not able to be in Texas for the lift right. onto the trailer. I had to have other people out there doing it. Um, and of course, I was here in Florida when it finally got lifted off on that tense moment where you can see the photo of it being lifted uh, by that crane uh, onto the uh, new location. And uh, we, we've got a cool video coming out soon about that. Ooh. We've got some cool drone footage and stuff and, and footage on the ground of the whole process so you can see the drone here on that picture too yeah yeah <laughs> that's funny how like i mean you might have said this but i may and may not have heard how many higgins boats higgins boats are still um in the world yeah very few um as far as exact numbers are concerned uh, i have it right here um because i believe it's only 19 surviving in in the world um, out of and there's only about nine or so here in the states that are are original Higgins boats. There's a lot of uh, post-war, re, uh, not reproductions, but mm -hmm. post-war models. Um, they were made with fiberglass hulls, uh, so they're a little bit lighter. They're uh, easier to maintain, easier to store, transport, all of the above. And of course, the World War II ones were had a wood body, made most of its wood. And that's something that I, I think people don't realize is that the Higgins boat. Um, is made mostly out of wood and there's only a few metal components including of course the big door right on the front so that was wow. probably the most challenging thing was 
getting it here intact with the the whole wood um, rotting away essentially while it was right. being lifted, transported. But it, it's stronger than we anticipated. Right. I can say that for for certain. <laughs> Did you do you know what what it endure like what it has been through during World War II? Do you know what where it was used for, or is it still a secret? Or At the moment, uh, I mean, it's not a secret, but at the moment, we don't know. Uh, if, okay. if I did know, of course, I would uh, be happy to share. But at the moment, we were we haven't not yet been able to find any uh, identifying uh, plaques, markers, or anything on the boat to put, to point it to a particular um, uh, campaign or a particular unit or anything like that. Um, unfortunately, we can't. We we have not yet been able to, or may not be able to find, or if if it's still there, uh, the right. fish Higgins placard with the uh, model number and everything, which would give an exact date of manufacture. Right. Um, we've looked in the places it should be, and we haven't been able to find it. But it's we haven't done a lot of of, of work or messing around with it yet because of the condition. We've got to get it into a, a inside location before restoration, right. and then the whole thing has to be um, meticulously taken apart. Um, to save as much original pieces as possible, because there's some that can't be saved, of course, and it have to be refabricated. Um, but as far as estimated date of manufacture, uh, we're guessing early 1945, based on some of the features on the uh, the, the rear of the boat and also the door. Um, awesome. I've been told by some experts that it's probably early 1945 that it, it dates to. So it may have participated in some of the Uh, late war Pacific campaigns. Right. Uh, it was it was initially found in California before it was moved to Texas. Oh, so that, that would make sense. sense for being in a Pacific campaign. Um, so further research will tell if possible. Awesome, man. And what are you planning to do with it? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, that was again another question that came up when we were working on acquiring this thing. Uh, and of course, the main goal right now is to get it into a secure indoor location for restoration, then begin work on that. Um, and our goal is to do sea, complete seaworthy condition so that you can bring it out on water again and, and use it as, as a, a boat. Um, it's definitely not an impossible goal. It will take a lot of work, but it's, it's definitely possible. Uh, and then eventually, after it's restored, um, my goal is to loan it to museums and institutions right. around the country that can use it for uh, their displays. Uh, we don't have a, a, a about a film, film sets. Anything. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And anyone who's interested in having it and, and using it, um, so that's what it's all about is to make it available to the public, uh, allow people to experience World War II history in this really remarkable way. Wow, that sounds awesome, man. You've got to come over when it's restored. And yeah, take a look. <laughs> I do, because I, uh, I still have some parts to explore in the United States. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much for opening up uh, and, you know, telling all these stories. I also ask awesome. you, because you are a traveling World War II museum, you, you know, you To bring to bring some items to you for you uh, with you to the show. Sorry, uh, yeah. You, I guess you. Yeah, you bought but brought three, if I'm correct. I brought three uh, little groupings uh, today. The first one I'll talk about is uh, Roy Morrison, and okay. uh, this one a very special grouping to me. And I brought um, a portion of it today, uh, a, a really incredible part. Um, this is Roy Morrison's Purple Heart, wow. uh, his dog tag. And this little bullet, which I'll explain the story behind. Wow. Uh, so Roy served in the 9th Infantry Division during World War II and landed on Utah Beach in Normandy on uh, D-Day Plus 4. So that was June 10th, 1944. Okay. Uh, he saw fierce combat in Normandy and was severely wounded on his birthday, uh, July 14th, uh, near the city of St. Lo. Mm -hmm. uh, he was hit with two bullets in the leg. Uh, and at the time, the doctors removed a bullet from his leg. Um, and, and he went back out and uh, finished the war. Uh, about 60 years later, he was having some pain in his lower back area. So he went in to get an x-ray, uh, which I believe you have a photo of there. You can see the x-ray. Oh, yes. Uh, and much to his surprise, uh, the doctors found a bullet in his leg uh, <laughs> that, was, that he was shot with uh, in Normandy during the war. And they removed that bullet from his leg. And he said that Um, if I carried the weight all these years, I can carry it the rest of my life. And so he wore this the bullet on a chain wow. um, around his neck um, until the day he died. Um, and this is the, the bullet here, which you can see. And in the wow. photograph, you can tell it, it never hit bone. It's not mushroomed out or anything. Right. Um, and um, it was this was donated by Roy's son at his funeral. Um, along with the purple heart and dog tag. What uh, an interesting connection. 
Roy's Roy's interview is one of the first ones that I ever did. I believe it was number three or four. And at the time I was 13 years old. So I had stayed in contact with him and his family for all these years. Mm -hmm. Uh, And when, during the initial interview, uh, he asked his son to go and get his uniform from the closet. Mm -hmm. And so his son comes out with this Ike jacket uh, with the ninth infantry division patch on the sleeve (laughs) and everything. Um, And Roy says, Oh, you can have it if you want it. And so I'm sitting there 13 years old and he offers me his uniform and this is amazing. And and I say, of course, Mm -hmm. yeah, I love this. And that was was really the beginning of, of the artifacts for me. And that's what started the whole traveling museum. Uh, And now of course I have his purple heart and his bullet, uh, his dog tag and everything else uh, to go with it. I have a large collection of items that was donated by him and his son uh, to go along with that. But Roy's story, uh, and the support that I've gotten from him, his family, uh, has been overwhelming. That is uh, amazing. They they helped make the Normandy Revisited film possible. And, uh, I've just been so so grateful for their support. And I'm just honored to carry on a Roy's story for generations to come. He sounds like a real badass. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) After the war, he was a firefighter, uh, for many years. Really? And, uh, got some pretty cool photos of him at uh, the firefighter uh, in Miami, actually. So he continued to serve his country, huh? That's, that's... Yes. Uh, I think I believe he served in the fire department for like 30 years or something. Pretty wow. remarkable guy, yeah. Wow. Uh, I've got a couple other stories here as well. Um, sure, the go next ahead. one that I'll, I'll share is um, uh, James Johnson. Uh, this is one of my favorite groupings that I, I have in, in the museum collection. Um, it was donated by uh, Mr. Johnson's children, uh, and, and Mr. Johnson was a Buffalo soldier during the war. Wow. And served in the 92nd Infantry Division, and this is just a portion of his items. I've got his uniform, a photo album, and all sorts of stuff. I've, I sent you some photographs as well. Um, and he served in the 599th Field Artillery Battalion, a mm-hmm. 92nd Infantry Division. Um, and he was serving in Italy when he was wounded in action, and uh, was, of course, awarded the Purple Heart for wounds received in action then. Right. Um, and after the war ended in Italy, he served in occupation duty and actually married an Italian woman uh, in, in 1946, they married. And um, I was really uh, amazed by this story. And I had the opportunity to acquire these artifacts from uh, his family. It was donated by his uh, son and daughter. And uh, a really remarkable story. I've got, I sent you a picture of their their wedding photograph, yeah. uh, a photo of them together. Uh, there's one photo, and there's a little uh, baby in um, her arms. Right. And that's Maria, who was the uh, their first child. And she was born in Italy at the 61st Station Hospital. And she's the one who donated these artifacts to me. Oh, wow. So that was remarkable to meet her and hear her story. And uh, not just about um, what she remembered from her parents, but, but what they went through after the war as an uh, interracial couple in the United States. Um, and right. she was still serving in the military into the 1950s. Um, and it was stationed with the 101st airborne. And um, ah, that's why you had the jacket there. Yeah. Yeah. He had the 101st airborne patch on his jacket there in the photo. You see, he was um, an administrative assistant with the 101 ah. and eventually became commanding officer of uh, the 272nd army band at mm-hmm. one point in the 50s. But he was discharged in 1952 as a chief warrant officer. Uh, but a really remarkable story. The photographs from the album are one of a kind. I've, I've never seen anything quite like it. Um, and it's one of my favorite collections to date. And uh, I, I share that story whenever I can because it's just so um, profound and impactful. And uh, I'm just um, it, it really privileged to carry on his legacy. Right. And unfortunately, uh, he passed away before I could even... Uh, talk to him but i was able to uh, learn his story as much as i could through his children right i love the 92nd infantry division i think they are a wonderful unit um and there's a lot there's so much interesting history there in these segregated army units yeah and there's so a... underrepresented as well exactly. i think that people don't understand the sacrifices made by exactly. um, not just african-american but hispanic soldiers right. uh, asian-american soldiers there are so many uh, uh, people that made up the, the the fight for greater victory during World War II that exactly. are forgotten and lost to time. And I think that that's one of the main things I try to do with with the project is share stories from from all aspects and perspectives of the war. Wow. Thank you, man. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing this wonderful story. Yeah, definitely. There's, a, there's, a one, there's one last item that you have. Yes, there's one more story. And this one's uh, pretty cool as well. 
Um, this belonged to a World War II veteran that I interviewed. Uh, his name was Richard Sable. Uh, and Mr. Sable uh, was a POW in Nazi Germany um, for just, a, just about a year, 11 months, he was a POW. Um, and he was a, a sergeant in the Army Air Corps and the 452nd Bomb Group, mm -hmm. uh, 8th Air Force, a ball turret gunner uh, aboard a B-17. Okay. And so on his 8th mission, which was uh, on May 12, 1944, his plane, which was nicknamed Princess Pat, uh, was hit by German fighters in flak uh, on a bombing raid over Czechoslovakia. And um, he had never been trained with a parachute. He had never done a parachute jump before. But when the, uh, the, uh, the, the pilot of the plane gave the order to jump, he went right out the bomb bay door and uh, bailed <laughs> into enemy territory, uh, swiftly captured by the Germans uh, and spent 11 months as a guest of the Third Reich um, in prison with his fellow airmen at Stalag Luft IV. Wow. Um, he, he remembers that he wasn't uh, abused or tortured at all during his captivity, mm -hmm. um, but conditions were obviously far from ideal. Um, the, the food was scarce and the winters were miserably cold. Uh, and after more than a, almost a year in captivity, he was liberated by the British in April of 1945. Hmm. And so when I interviewed Mr. Sable, uh, obviously his story was remarkable. And I, as I do always at the end of the interview, I asked them if they have any artifacts from their time in service. Right. And so he he's sitting on his chair and uh, his neighbor was over uh, as well during the interview. And, and she said, Oh, I believe you have a couple things in your, in your room over there. So she and I go into his um, room and, and we pull out these um, items, his medals. They were sitting in a drawer uh, in his, in his room, essentially. Mm -hmm. And um, we bring them over. And that's when he told me that he has no surviving family. Uh, none. He's oh. the last of his uh, family. And so at that moment, he says, well, if you're interested, you can have these artifacts uh, and carry them on for generations to come. So wow. he donated these artifacts to me. Um, and I'll share one thing in particular. I'll open it up real quick. Sure. Uh, medals. There's his his uh, gunner wings. You've got um, there's one photo I sent of a, a little pin. It's, it's the Caterpillar Club pin, uh, which is a very um, exclusive group, essentially uh, informal group of, of airmen who bailed out over enemy territory during the war. Um, oh, I it's see. It's a little it. little golden caterpillar. There it is. Called caterpillar Club. Uh, very interesting. Uh, to I look did up. not know that. That's interesting. It's Thank a pretty you. cool story. Uh, but in addition to the medals and the patches and everything, photos are uh, about a dozen or so letters that he wrote home from the prisoner of war camp in Germany. So they're postmarked. Um, from Kriegsgefangenen Post, which is a uh, prisoner of war mail right. in German. Um, it has his name on there. I'm not sure if you can see it right there, Sergeant Richard Sable. Um, it's passed by the US censor, passed by the German censor, which is pretty interesting. Uh, and of course, I, on the back is his. his um, I have always his wondered letter. about this. Wow. Yeah, I've always it, wondered how that happened. I, I, they would send all sorts of, of, of different styles as well. I've got another one right here. But how would uh, they... I, this is something I've never really looked into. It is, you, you made me curious now because I'm wondering how how were the Germans and the Americans exchanging mill? It was through the Red Cross. Uh, the American okay. Red Cross would facilitate the, 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 the mail. Of course, they did the Red Cross packages and things like that right. as well. Um, but here's another, another one. This is in a different format. That last one I showed you was a postcard. Uh, this one is, is similar on the front. You can see it has the, it says mit Luftpost per avion, which is uh, air, of course, air mail. Okay. Uh, and this one actually opens up into a, a larger, um, letter and you can wow. see it's a, a larger thing, How similar cute. to the email style, I guess. Um, this was his first letter that he sent when he was captured because it says on the, on the back, Sergeant Richard Sable, um, and it says below it says a uh, Gefanigan number, which is prisoner number. They would mm -hmm. have that number on a special tag that they would wear with their American dog tags. And it says not yet allotted, which means that he was not yet processed into their prisoner of war system when he wrote this letter. Wow. So this is the first letter that he wrote when he was captured. Uh, and I believe it's dated uh, here somewhere. I can't make it out, but this was the first one that he wrote when he was captured. Pretty, pretty cool story. And he wrote it to his wife? Uh, I believe he wrote it to a friend, a friend uh, in, or Chicago, a in Chicago, Illinois. I'm not okay. sure exactly. It says Mr. and Mrs. Walter Brownice. Okay. Um, not his parents, he said, but um, it was a friend, I believe, in Chicago. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. That's so interesting. 
while you were telling this, I was try I tried to look up. Did you see the um, missing aircraft reports of his aircraft? I have. I've looked them up before. I don't have them handy at the moment. Okay. But, uh, yeah. It's just I, I I thought it was interesting to look them up. For because... sure, the missing air crew reports are such. Uh, valuable pieces of information. I, I found so much great data from all sorts of of um, aircraft through those, right. and uh, I'm not. I can't see what you're pulling up at the moment. Oh, well, this one. It's pretty long. Good. It's it's a pretty big file. Twenty three pages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but it has the aircraft serial. Normally, there's interviews with people with eyewitnesses, but I cannot seem to. Uh, I don't have. I I like. I I just didn't know. So I have to, I need time to to properly look yeah. into this, but yeah, yeah. Uh, it's always research is always the best part. And right. so uh, I got these a couple of years ago, and I've always been uh, it's always been cool to, to research them when I can. And I've got several other POW groupings from the families and also from veterans themselves that are always interesting to to have. Um, if you bear with me for one moment, I'll get one one thing. Okay. Right. I, okay. Why not? Go for it. We're already at forty five minutes, but I don't care. But uh, let's let's. I'm sharing the uh, MACR, the missing aircraft report. Richard V. Okay. Sable. I have Richard V. Sable on the screen now. It's like it's. So what we have here, I mentioned on the prisoner of war um, uh, letters. There is a number. Uh, of course, their prisoner of war number. Uh huh. Uh, I can't seem to locate it on Mr. Sable's right at the moment. Uh, but anyway. That number on that letter also corresponds to this, which is the prisoner of war dog tag, which is issued to um, the German American prisoners of war or allied prisoners of war, I should say, that were shot down uh, in Germany or, or captured in Germany, I should say. And so this is one that belonged to a veteran that I interviewed, Edward Quigley, uh, and he was also an 8th Air Force uh, co-pilot, I believe, oh, wow. or navigator. Uh, and so it's a different different veteran, but this is the um the tag and his is numbered four four five zero which is his like a funny good number because they're mm -hmm. a war number right it says all the lift one which is the camp he was held at so that's an interesting connection to that story exactly i did i knew about those tags i've never really seen one up until now <laughs> the, yeah. the one you just showed me that's pretty they're, cool. they're pretty cool and uh they would wear those with their regular dog tags and uh, after mr quigley passed away his family donated uh, this, along with more of those letters um, from his time in service. That's amazing, man. I'm, 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 I'm really great that you have such a huge collection, but that you're also doing wonderful stuff and teaching the younger generations with it. Thank it's you. It's important to use the collection. I think that's the most important thing is to make it available for people exactly. to see, um, and not just have the artifacts and, and and store them. I think that the the main mission of of the project is to get the stories out there, whether it's through veteran interviews, historic right. artifacts, um, anything um, that is a story deserves to be told, and uh, I'm doing the best I can to tell it in as many right. ways as possible. Yeah. What, what? Just because I have a quick thought. And something that I try to look in over the past week is photogrammetry, is 3D scanning, 3D photography, mm -hmm. where you basically make a lot of photographs from different angles angles of a certain object. And then there's certain software that allows you to make a 3D scan, like a high quality scan of that object. And you create a 3D object on your computer. And then basically you can do whatever you can do whatever you want with it. And I was like, oh, it would be so cool to have like a virtual 3D museum where people go in with a VR thing or really really else. great idea yeah and i've never personally experimented with it but when i right. saw what you, you shared a couple of things with me and that looked pretty right. cool yeah, it's definitely a uh something i haven't seen before definitely a, a, a new technology that deserves to be explored all right anyways thank you so much for telling your stories we are at 40 48 minutes and uh we, man i've i've learned i've learned so much from you <laughs> in these 50 minutes so well, thank, thank you thank you so much for coming in for coming on my podcast glad to be here yeah. and um you know i i'm sure we will talk soon and uh, we, definitely i will see you either on on american ground american soil or we yep. will see you here in Let's europe. Ho hopefully in europe sooner than that <laughs> all right all right man thank you so much this was snafu podcast number four thank you